Hello, my name is Mark Taylor and welcome to the Education on Fire podcast. The place for creative and inspiring learning from around the world. Listen to teachers, parents and mentors share how they are supporting children to live their best authentic life and are proving to be a guiding light to us all. Hello and welcome. Thank you for spending some more time with us here on the Education on Fire podcast. With homeschooling being such a a key factor with so many people's lives in recent weeks, quality resources obviously have been the most supportive thing, whether you're a parent supporting your children at home, with your teachers providing work and pointing people in the right direction. And I think the BBC have had an integral part and an important role to play in all of this with their BBC Bite Size website and also their teacher talks as part of that. I was really delighted when the BBC reached out to me and asked if I could speak to one of their presenters, Jordan Firth, and he's going to give us a little bit of an insight into the whole process of how these things were recorded and his experience as a year one teacher, as well as a, a little mention of his his own podcast. I just want to take this opportunity to once again thank our sponsor, the National Association for Primary Education. They are currently giving away a free e-copy of their professional journal, Primary First, which you can get just by going to their website at nape.org.uk. That's N-A-P-E dot org dot U-K. But this is my conversation with Jordan Firth about his experience of being a presenter on BBC Bite Size. Hi Jordan, thank you so much for joining us today and I'm really excited to talk about the BBC Bite Size because I know it's been supporting many teachers and, and families all around the country. So yeah, thank you very much for being here. Absolute pleasure, thanks for having me. Let's start with, with that BBC Bite Size. How did you get involved in it and exactly what are you actually doing as part of that programme? Yeah, so I, I'm quite active on Twitter now um, for my sins at times, um, but I've got kind of just a a teacher Twitter account, just a Mr. Firth one that's that's just dedicated to our teaching and education. And um, I kind of try and take a bit of a lighthearted look on everything. So I've done a few um, videos and put them out there, just kind of parodies of, of life in the classroom. Um, and one of the producers on BBC Bite Size came across one of them um, and asked me to send off, well, told me a little bit about the project that they were doing um, and then asked me to send off like an audition tape um to them so i sent that off and they, they liked it and uh, yeah i got invited into the studio so i'm i'm part of teacher talks which is the short five minute clips of kind of key maths and english skills um you know right through primary and, and into some secondary just things that you know it's, it's real teachers kind of delivering that content and you know just keeping everybody ticking over to kind of supplement and and complement all the amazing work that schools are already sending out for their for their kids just as that part of bbc's big education push on the on assisting people with their their homeschooling but well, it really is um I, th- I just think as a as an organization like the bbc it's so it's so heartwarming to sort of hear them being involved in this way and actually because they have the reach because they have the facilities to do that I think it's when I mean I personally always value them greatly but I I just think it's such a way of 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 unifying everything that's going on as as the British Broadcasting Corporation. Yeah absolutely I'd heard about it all what they were doing before I got asked to be involved so it was a bit of a it was a bit of a no-brainer really and what I quite like about what they've done is that they have kind of you know, they've gone down that a little bit of a, a celebrity route to kind of promote it. So you've got like Danny Dyer doing history and Brian Cox doing this and Rachel Riley doing maths and all that sort of stuff. But actually behind it all, they've had a massive push on getting real teachers involved and, you know, not just me and the other teachers doing part of the presenting, but, you know, it's real teachers that are, are planning it all and writing everything. And they've got so many people involved kind of behind the scenes. It's It's been in great to see that they actually really value that input from, from the people that are inside the classroom. And how does it work in terms of, of the curriculum? You said it's sort of, is it supplementing what's going on in terms that you can go and you can watch a whole load and you pick and choose what you think will work for your class at the moment or, or does it sort of run in a certain format? So the BBC, with their Bite Size Daily, they kind of um, came up with their own sort of medium long-term plans of what they were going to cover. Um, so that that does kind of run in a structured f- format that, that you can follow. Um, the Teacher Talks videos 
sometimes run, run alongside what they're doing, but I think they're designed to just be standalone. So, for example, the ones that came out today for me were in key stage one, they were shape and time. So I think it's just if you're a parent at home or you're a teacher and you're doing something on shape or time, um, then you know, that's a really quick, easy five minute clip from an actual teacher to send um, to send home and the, and the children can access it. And I think what they want to do is build a bit of longevity with this as well. So, you know, not at no point did I say, oh, you know, I hope you're all keeping well at home and, you know, and I hope you're all staying safe and all this sort of stuff. Whilst it is primarily for now, while we're in this lockdown and while schools are fit well, the official line is that they're closed. Um, that you know that is primarily what it's for but i think they want it to be there for quite a long time so there's we've you know they've built this huge bank of resources that teachers and parents can call upon at, at any point really yeah and i think that's something which i'm hearing quite a lot at the moment is the fact that yes circumstances are such that organizations and companies and, and tech companies are doing all sorts of things to to make the most of the situation in terms of supporting teachers and parents and, and everyone but actually what it's doing is it's also giving us a wealth of experience and a wealth of resources which actually will be used integrally I think as we go forward because our ideas of exactly how we interact in and the home life and the school life specifically actually I think will morph slightly. Yeah I think when I, when I speak to a lot of parents I think you know their attitudes on on kind of the jobs that, that teachers do has changed a little um, and I think in, you know in terms of schools and, and things that, I, I, I do think and, and hope for the better that, that you know, things might change, that, that organisations and schools might see things that they were doing that they think, actually, we don't need to be doing that anymore. You know, that wasn't that important. And, you know, I think hopefully priorities might change a little, I think. And, and um, on as a whole, I think people are kind of appreciating more than ever the jobs that teachers are doing. I know you, you hear from all sides and it tends to be in the media that certain sides shout the loudest, um, especially at the moment. But I think in general, I think it's been quite quite positive for the profession, um, this kind of time where the scene is all pulled together and, and, and parents and people can appreciate the job that we actually do do as they're trying to kind of replicate that at home. I certainly think from from my experience and my perspective, I think one of the things which I found extraordinary really was the the fact that with limited guidance because of the amount of time and the fact that the situation changed so fast, the ability to kind of decide what to do, how to make it work for your school in the best way for your pupils, it had to be individualised to some extent because everyone's situation is different. And I think it just goes to show, which I know people in the profession have talked about for a long time, that you know, because you've got that wealth of experience, the understanding of, of the children and, and your local environment, actually when you've got the ability to make those decisions and just put them into place you know real magic happens and it's a really sad and difficult time at the moment but some amazing things have come out of it yeah i think yeah like i said we have pulled together quite well you know i, I don't envy any school leader or head teacher out there at the moment and the, you know gosh the, the work they've had to put in and the organization they've had to they've had to, to put together but you know they just they have they've just done it you know and then same with with working with the BBC as well just the the time frame from when lockdown got announced to when they started putting this content out was was so quick you know people spring into action and and the reason for that is just that you know we care we're bothered about the education mm -hmm. that, that we're giving these children and, and so we, we'll make it work now the great thing about having you on today is not only do um do we have the fact we can talk about the content like you say because you've been delivering it but because you've been directly involved we can have that sort of behind the scenes idea as well which is always really interesting for people so mm. so like you said there to take us through the kind of the process in terms of from being asked to do it and then the practical steps in terms of where do you record how do you record how many at one time how did all that kind of thing work so um i went to media city in in salford to the bbc studios and it it it, I, I agree. It was fascinating for me um, just being a part of it. Teaching has been my only career, really. So, you know, seeing behind the camera and seeing this whole other world, this whole other industry at work was was really fascinating. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm used to teaching in front of 30 kids and having them to bounce off of and having the energy in the room and all these engaged eyes on you. Well, most of the time. Um, <laughs> so just talking to a camera 
um, it was a little strange to begin with. Um, so yeah, it's just a small studio, a really small crew that I was working with, and, and it, I did get settled in quite quickly. A, a shout out to that crew, um, Hannah, Lauren, and Mark. They they made me feel really settled and comfortable straight away. But it is they're they're, they're five minute videos, and each video must have taken maybe about. 45 minutes to film and then before that you know you've got the the education consultant and the script writer and the producers and all these people that it's got to go through just for your and then it gets sent off to the animators and just for your you know five minutes of of teaching it's it's crazy actually how much goes go how much effort gets put in behind that little five minute clip but yeah we did five in a day um was our target and we always got those so i i was in three times and we we recorded 15 but there are there are 90 teacher talks videos out there so they did they worked flat out for a good few weeks it's re- it's always really interesting isn't it that sort of s- seeing it sort of from the inside looking out like you say because you're an integral part because you're presenting it and putting it all together but also like you say a completely different world of understanding how it actually is because we all consume media we see stuff on the telly we see stuff on youtube and actually to to have an integral part of that is uh is really interesting and, and how did you find that in relation to to your podcast your sort of hands up podcast in terms of you sort of got that idea of producing from a, an audio point of view was there any sort of similarities or or how did you find that i'm not sure about similarities because when you go to so, sort of something as big as the bbc that's you know that's so professional and our our podcast um <laughs> whilst I love it to bits I don't know how professional uh, it would ever come across um, and we do the podcast because we we love it. It, it we you know it we enjoy doing it it gives us a you know, we blow off a bit of steam and we have a laugh about the the teaching profession um whereas this this felt more like I was properly involved in something pretty big here I think the podcast we've got a, a really good listener base um but you know, like you said before, having kind of the might of the BBC behind behind this was yeah, it was totally different. I mean, who knows the future? But could you see yourself enjoying it so much that you would do more and more of that kind of thing, or, or is, is is the fundamentally being in the classroom that the heart of where where your life lies? Um, I I would love to. I I really really enjoyed it, and and I I got a lot out of it. Um, and. But I just don't think anything can compare to to teaching in front of thirty children. That there is no substitution or re, or replacement that you can get for you know that that feedback that you get from the children and, and that interaction that you get from them. Um, I did love it, and and I, I would say <laughs> never say never. But I think my heart lies in the classroom uh, at the moment. And I, I really like the fact that there there are people out there who are able to to, to combine the two. <clears throat> I think it's really important that the people yeah. that are doing it, like you say, are, are, are teachers first and foremost. And I think to be able to have enough flexibility to be able to go out for a day or two, um, I know current situation aside, but, you know, e- even in normal times, in inverted commas, you know, the ability to have an afternoon here or a day here to go and be able to support everybody in that, I think has been really good. Can you tell us a little bit about about your school itself? How, what sort of setup is it? What year group do you teach, and, and, and how do you find it? Yeah, I'm a I'm a year one teacher. Um, we're a four form infant school uh, actually, so we are quite a big school, but we're just infants. So reception year one and year two. I've this is my fifth year teaching now, um, and I was in year two at the same school for the first four years. So year one even though it's only a year below, was a little bit of a culture shock for me to begin with, especially at the beginning, we were doing things like continuous provision and just the kind of settling in period from reception to, to year one was um, was quite different. Um, yeah, we're, we're a big school in, in Huddersfield and, and going back to what you were saying about the, the, the BBC stuff and, and doing both, I think that would be the ideal. I, I think it's really important when you have educators out there that you know maybe are doing things like being in the media or being on TV, I think it's really important that they do always have their toes dipped in the classroom still so they never lose sight. And um, our head was great about me going and, and doing it. And, you know, I had to swap um, a day on the rotor and stuff in school one of the times and things like that so I could I could get in and record them. So um, she's been really supportive as well, which is, which is good. It's what you need, isn't it? 
Yeah, and I, and I think I think it it brings something to the school, doesn't it? As well, just just having been there and done it yourself brings something different to you, which must just inherently um, come across with everybody else. Oh yeah, definitely. I think the novelty is for the children in my class. Sort of seeing me on TV <laughs> was uh, <laughs> like they can't get away from me. Even during a pandemic, I'm still there in the living rooms in HD <laughs> on the TVs, <laughs> poor kids. <laughs> And um, so let's talk a little bit about the, the sorts of experience that you've got that you can you can share with some other people and, and tell us a little bit about what was valuable about your own school experience. And that can be a combination of, of being a, a child in school, but also obviously as a teacher as well. Do you know, yeah, when when people ask this, I, I do think about m- myself as a child and do you know, I, do, I don't ever really remember properly enjoying school. And I, and I don't know, I guess. I don't hear that many teacher interviews uh, anymore, and so I always expect these people to have, you know, had a really positive um, school experience. Um, I just think, although I suppose you wouldn't believe it, looking at my Twitter page and all the videos and stuff I put out there, and you know, being on the camera and all my podcast recordings, but I was a really, really, really shy kid, and I'm still a pretty awkward adult at times. Um, but I was really quiet. So primary school, I had like one best friend and then I, I changed high schools in year eight um but everyone in year seven at that school the year before I joined they'd been on this big residential towards the end of a year and all those friendships had formed and it was any all anyone spoke about so I felt quite isolated at school um and it wasn't until kind of sixth form college that I really I think people started understanding my humor and I started making a lot of friends um so it's a really difficult one to answer really because I I absolutely love being in the classroom now and I, and I, I live for being in school now and, and maybe I'm trying to sort of put across that positive experience that, that I wanted in school but no, I, yeah, I, I never really enjoyed being a, <laughs> a pupil in school which is sorry, not the answer that uh, a lot of people will probably give but yeah, I, I don't think back too positively about my own school experience. I think it's always really interesting to to hear that whole breadth of, of like say people's thoughts and, and their own experiences because like you say sometimes you might have a misconceived idea that oh it must have been like this or it must have been like that and I think hearing a whole um, ray of um, a whole range of these things is really good because that you know you know you're making a massive impact now in so many children's lives but like you said not from the sense of I just want to carry on doing what I've experienced already it's kind of I want to show up as I am now and actually make that the the integral part. Of, of of the children's lives that I'm now a part of, and and I think that's a really important factor. Yeah, and, and don't get me wrong, it wasn't you know awful by any stretch, and I'm sure people have had worse worse experiences um, than than I have. Um, but yeah, it's it, I, people say it's the best days of your life, don't they? And I think I've just never really quite seen that, and maybe that's just because you know I've had better days and better experiences in school as an adult that I don't look back on my experiences in school as a child with quite as much fondness as I do when I think about them as a teacher yeah and I think they are the best days of your lives when they are the best days of your lives if yeah, they're not, exactly. they're not. So yeah exactly <laughs> it does depend on who you're speaking to about that <laughs> um are there any particular teachers that you remember and and why 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 did they stick out for you uh again not really. As I said before, I was I was a really quiet kid, so I don't think teachers really had the chance to build that relationship with me in that way. Um, what what I do remember in primary school though is a TA. I think he was a TA, but maybe thinking back now and, and what what we did, he might have been a student teacher actually. But I was in year three and we were doing the Egyptians, and I remember absolutely loving this topic and being so involved in it and engaged. And we made this child sized sarcophagus as a whole class and. Um, and he used to call me a weird name. I can't remember what it was now. So my name's Jordan, and it, and he used to call me like Jordanian or something. You know, like the resident of the, <laughs> a resident of the country, Jordan. And I guess I don't know. I think that interaction just re- always really stood out to me. Um, you know, just the fact that maybe he kind of saw me and noticed me, and I, I felt like a, a bit more of a part of it when he kind of gave me a nickname. And he always used to read Paddington to us, and Paddington is my absolute favourite children's character. So that. That always stuck out with me too, um, but I think that's the only one. And it's getting so long ago, but it, it, it really sticks out. I can really vividly remember what this um, Egyptian sarcophagus looked like and painting it and using all the chicken wire and stuff. Um, but that, yeah, 
I can't remember his name either, which is really bad. But I, I suppose at year three, I'll have only been um, seven or eight. So it's quite a stretch to think that far back now. Yeah, absolutely. One thing I just want to ask, um, based on the sorts of things that you've just been saying, is the thing I do hear quite often is, is people saying that it's often the person that saw me you know, in inverted commas, mm. you know, the, the person that understood me, that kind of got me, that was able to sort of connect to, to me as a person, which made the biggest impact. Um, you mentioned about being shy. If you've got any, having sort of experienced that yourself, if you've got anything which you do that kind of helps you get to know some of the shy children that you teach or, or, or way of kind of connecting and giving them the confidence to kind of build that relationship? I think I think I am quite aware of it. Uh, as a teacher um and i yeah i can kind of see myself in 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 some children when they're when they're there being quiet um i think i i always make a point i think you, you know your your daily interactions with them are, are really important so not sort of i don't want it to come across as sounding like you're making an effort um because it shouldn't really feel like an effort um, the best way I could describe it, I guess, is like effortless effort. I think they just need to know that you do, you know, just that you are aware of them. And, and some of those children, and myself included at times, won't have wanted to have been forced into groups or friendships or, you know, making you feel like you someone needs to look after you or that you're a bit of a burden. But I think it's just being aware of them. And, and you know, you might be the only person that they talk to in school that day because they, they don't think that you know they, they don't communicate with any other children so I think it's, it's really important that those um, interactions you have with them are, are really positive I you know I still sometimes feel like I do as a child and, I, and I've said quite often before that there's a difference between Mr Firth and Jordan even as an adult when I'm Mr Firth I'm kind of performing a little bit and I'm being this uh, this character, and then when I'm when I'm at home, I'm just Jordan. I'm just I'm quite quiet again, and, and I'm just me. I, I really like that, and I, and I think in some ways, it, I sort of in, in my head, I had this image of that kind of I see you, you see me, kind of look across a classroom, and that's kind of all that you need is yeah. that connection. Like I say, with that, you know, the, any doing anything beyond that, you know, because like I say, that might be all that's needed just to kind of to support that child. Yeah, I really love it. Um, what was the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Now, what I'm about to say, I'm not sure if this is great advice for a teacher now, if I think about it, but a head teacher at a school where I was, when I was doing my teacher training, we were talking about, I think he was talking about how he got into headship and and, and things like that. Um, and he said to me, he said, if, if someone offers you something, like an extra responsibility or an opportunity, just take it. Just say yes. Just say yes to everything because you don't know if that opportunity will ever come up again. Now, at the time, and for me, who was someone who was still pretty reserved, I guess, and, and quite shy and just finding my feet into teaching and stuff like that, that was perfect advice for me because when I think about the opportunities I've had with the, the podcast, um, you know, I've delivered training to schools and leaders and my own leadership responsibilities, my work with the BBC, every time I got offered something like that, I always thought back to that advice and I always said yes. So I wouldn't be where I am now, I don't think, if I'd not had that in the back of my mind, just to give me that little push and say, no, do you know what? I'll just say yes to it because it might not, the opportunity might not come back again. Um, so that advice really worked for me. However, as a teacher now, and I was a trainee when I heard that advice, um, as a teacher now and knowing the profession as I do, I think that teachers, we can be really quick to say yes to something and take too many things on and our workload is, is, is big enough as it is. So I would also say, <laughs> don't be afraid to say no and do what's best for you, which I realize completely contradicts the other advice. But there we go. I think you just need to kind of manage it. That advice worked for me because it gave me a bit of a push, but I do know people and, and I've got to that place before where you just feel so overburdened by your workload and, but you, you don't want to say no because you don't want to feel like you're letting anybody down um I think it is important that, that as teachers we we can at some point just manage ourselves enough to go no do you know what enough's enough I need to tick off what's on my to-do list uh, first and then I'll think about doing something else yeah I think I think like you say having that sort of caveat of just kind of it's a great idea to start with and really 
take it for what it is and then like say put it in that bigger picture and and like say the world is different now than it was even just a few years ago in terms of responsibilities and time and all of that kind yeah. of thing and and fitting it into your fabric both as a as a teacher and as an educator as a as a family person you know all of these things really really do make a big difference what advice would you give your younger self now um do you know what i think whatever i said to him about uh where i'm at now this younger self you know you, you stand up and speak in front of people for a living you know you've been on tv and you've done a podcast and been on the radio and stuff i don't think he'd believe me to be honest um he'd probably say what's a podcast um if i'm talking <laughs> to my younger self and I, he probably also wouldn't actually talk to me because he'd be too shy to um but um john i, re- I remember being at university so not my you know younger young younger self but um you know, at uni, times are hard and you're scraping the pennies together. And when I used to come back home, I'd always go for a, uh, for a beer with my best mate, Ben. And we'd always, we'd have to see how far we could get with like 12, 12 quid or whatever, because we, we have no money, we're students. Uh, and to be fair, we knew the landlord, so we always did all right. But um, <laughs> we always used to say, we just used to sit there. And I remember this conversation coming up all the time when we were talking about careers and neither of us had any idea what we wanted to do. But we always just said, as long as we can just come here or just go to a pub and meet up and have a drink and not have to worry about if we can afford another round, um, then we've, we've made it. Then we'll be happy and we'll be content with what we've got. And, I, and I'll never forget that. And I think there's a lot of there's still, you know there's a lot of people out there that still don't have that luxury. And I remember what it was like to not be able to just do to just do that. So I think my younger self were probably really happy that I'd just gotten to that point, um, especially because I did uh, design at uni and I knew, you know, halfway in that I didn't want to do it. That's not the career I wanted to pursue. So I had absolutely no idea where I wanted to go with my life at that point. You know, teaching's not always been this calling to me that I've had, um, you know, since I was young. So I think at that point I had no idea what I was going to do or anything like that. So I think I'd probably just say to him, you know what? you'll be fine you can go you can get the next round in don't worry about it exactly hanging out with your mates and being able to share that time it's such such an important thing i really love it um and you talked about design there i know you you enjoy painting as well tell us a little bit about that artistic side in your life when i did my a levels i think product design which is what i did at uni i think i got my worst grade in that but i've always been quite a creative person and so when i went to uni i still wanted to feel like i was doing something that i really enjoyed um and for whatever reason, that just that just didn't work out. But I think the joy of teaching um, and, you know, and, and the painting that I do as a hobby is that you can still be creative. I can put my creativity to, to, to really good use, um, whether that's, you know, j- just doing a, a fancy display <laughs> or making a, a decent worksheet if I ever need to do that. Um, I, I find it really therapeutic. So I've always been a really creative person and... Um, and yeah, painting. I love painting with watercolors. I think it's such a such a beautiful art medium. Um, I just don't really get the time anymore. So it's a it's a, like a really kind of feels like a really special occasion when I've got a good you know a couple of hours to myself and I can get all my paints out and just sit and just think about nothing but um, but painting. I used to want to be a, a children's illustrator actually, um, but I, yeah, I, I'm quite good at. Um, copying other people's art so I'm good at like you know painting children's characters but coming up with your own is a bit different yeah either that or master forger depending on which career path you end up going yeah (laughs) definitely So just before we, we, we talk a little bit about where people can find out about the BBC Bite Size and those great resources, is there any podcast, film or any resource which has had a big impact on your life? Yeah, so I was I was going to go a bit outside the box for this one because I... I do consume all those things. I'm a huge fan of, of, of cinema and uh, and TV and podcasts and things like that. Um, when I was thinking about just something that's had a, a, a massive impact on my on my life, I had, you know, I love you know Jurassic Park, uh, but I don't know how much of an impact it's had on me. <laughs> um, <laughs> so when I was thinking in terms of teaching, I've just it just made me think of this story, and I've got. After I'd finished uni, I worked at a, sh- a shop in York called Wittards, and they sell um, tea leaves and coffee beans. Um, and we had to know about all the different types of tea and coffee so we could help the customers decide which they'd like, you know, and, and whatnot. And I was explaining to a customer the origin of this certain type of tea, um, Assam, 
which is my favourite tea, fun fact. Um, anyway, I was, I was telling her all about it, probably really enthusiastically because it was my favourite tea. And after I'd finished, she just went, hmm, you'd make a good teacher. And that, and that was it. That was what got the ball rolling for my, you know, for me to think about being in the classroom and getting involved and volunteering. And I was a TA and all that sort of stuff. And so when I think of impact on anything in my life, especially in terms of teaching, that random, really small comment from a random woman somewhere in, God, she might have even been a tourist, so somewhere from around the world, I think has had the biggest impact on me that, and she'll never realize that. She just went, huh. You'd make a good teacher, and that was that was it. It's something just kind of lit up in me. That's what I always have to say if if I'm ever being interviewed or you know a job interview. Why? What made you want to be a teacher? <laughs> That's my yeah. answer. It wasn't you know, like I say, it wasn't some big calling that I'd had since I was since I was young. It was just that one little comment that made me start thinking, and then yeah, I've not looked back. I love that, and and it does remind me because sometimes people sort of ask you for advice or they say should you say this should you know should you offer advice when it's not been asked for or should you keep things to yourself and all that and my personal opinion is is that you should say whatever you feel called to at the time and sometimes it might be some big fanciful thing sometimes it might just be an off-the-cuff comment which is hardly a thought at all but you don't know what impact that's going to have on the other person and I think if it just comes from you being you like you say it can change someone's entire life without you ever knowing it. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that, you know, that is genuinely what it's done. I remember talking to my manager and saying, oh, she said I'd, I'd be a good teacher. And he went, yeah, yeah, I agree. And then we just had this conversation about it. And then I, I looked into volunteering in schools and I did that for a while. Then I became a TA and I did my training. It, it, that is literally the, the kind of sliding doors moment in my life, I guess, yeah. that pivotal moment where that was when I started to look into it. And yes, so I say she'll she'll never know whoever she is out there maybe she's listening maybe she'll remember but yeah, uh, yeah massive <laughs> fantastic so t- tell us exactly um going back to the BBC bite size where, where can people find all the details and, and everything that we've spoke about to begin with um so that they can make the most of these fantastic resources so uh, Teacher Talks that I'm part of um, is on BBC iPlayer. So if you search Teacher Talks in iPlayer, that'll come up. It's all part of the um, BBC Bite Size content. So if you search for um, BBC Bite Size Daily, that's where you can get all their daily resources and lessons uh, and things like that. So yeah, it's sort of across the BBC on the websites and on BBC iPlayer. Fantastic. Well, Jordan, thank you so much for for spending some time with us. It's really interesting to have both that sort of behind the scenes and also the educational chat in in, in one conversation. And um, um, I wish you well and hopefully you get the chance to to do some more. And I'll definitely be checking out all 15 of those uh, videos uh, and and seeing exactly what it's like just from the audience point of view, having heard from behind the scenes. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Education on Fire podcast. For more information of each episode and to get in touch, go to educationonfire.com. Education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire.